Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart for thy love and kindness is before thine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with assemblers. I have hated a congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass that altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of the house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and in the congregation will I bless the Lord. Salah and Salah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. My dear brethren, whether you are near or far, allow me again, I must have to tell you that what I did last Saturday did not rest in peace because someone, two people had already called me to say, oh, elder, my elder, you're touching and very sensitive matters for a black woman. Really? I even had a conversation with a priest, an Israelite elder. And I had a discussion with him when it comes to the dog situation. But let me just before I get into my, my lesson, which we'll continue to do with the Ark of the Covenant and Gentile and all of that. So let me just explain this to you. We never loved dogs in the first place, and this is what I, I told them. I don't know why black people now having the dogs everywhere in the bedroom in the house. You know, I don't know why. Dogs were one of our biggest enemies. We can love anything else and hate dogs. Dogs were trained how to bite your ankle when you're getting away to get freedom. They were trained. Master loved dogs. And Martha would say, dog is man's best friend. Why? Because he can keep a slave once he has dogs. Because if the, if the slave tried to run away, the dog would get the slave. So don't even worry about the Bible, what I'm saying. The, I, what I read is from the Bible. To tell you what the God of Israel says. What Jesus says. What everybody says. But you don't want to believe the Bible. If you don't want to believe what the Bible says, for God's sake, remember what your foreparents went through where the dogs are concerned. Now, you love dogs. Isn't it a crying shame that you are calling dog your best friend now? Okay. I hope that would close that off. The other matter that I've been talking about. I'm not going to go so much in the hair for the woman. All I said is when my sisters in the 60s, because even before that, all the way up to the 60s, all the women were fighting alongside our men. They had hair like wool. And they were real soldiers fighting for what we are enjoying today and believe that we are all accepted in society. The next matter we discuss before we get our lesson, uh, it's so difficult to bring all of this forward into what we want to believe, what the world is. I'm seeing Christian teachers they're out there reading the Bible, calling on all these names in the Bible. These names that you're calling on, David and Nehemiah and, and uh, Jeremiah, they're all Israelites. But you are making it seem that like this is some general statement that you make it and making it popular. 
And I'm saying, if I love my people, and I want my people to be above all people, therefore you should understand that they have other people in the world. I don't want everybody to be black. That don't give Israel any power. But if I have the power to teach all nations, that's what the God of Israel wants me to do. Because he says, you know what? The Gentiles knew this. When they had Christianity, I told you that in my last lesson. It was a crime for you to read because you would have seen it there. Now, you pick up from Elder Shadrach, and I said if you got 20,000 uh, people in your Hebrew stuff, 19,000 are leaders, because every black man wants to be a leader, and he can't. He doesn't have the spiritual know-how how to do this. Take for instance, I'm gonna do my lesson just now, but I just wanna clear all the all these conversations that I was having before. There's a man in Russia called Putin, and he's a leader, and he's a president. And he made a statement that Jesus is black. And you get all these people running and quoting him you know, like fools. I don't have to listen to Putin to know that Jesus is black or God is black. I say it all the time. It's in the Bible. Hair like wool. Feet like burnt brass. I don't need more. I don't mean, people say, oh, he's a little Middle Eastern. No, no, Middle Eastern, they got straight hair. He was black. Woolly hair, burnt skin. I don't need Putin to tell me that. And they're writing all these things. Putin, make that political statement. So now we can go in and rape Africa. Because now you're going to say, Putin is on my side. He believes God is black. So he would go right in. That political statement is very powerful. Because they've been doing it all the time. It is so very easy to hate America. Very easy to do that. Because America enslaved, America do this. But you name one other country. One other so-called white country that would have a very black woman in the United Nations. She's not from Africa. Representing the most powerful nation in the world. Tell me, which European country would have a black Secretary of Defense to represent the entire nation and allies of the United States? Tell me, which nation would have a black press secretary to say what's going on in the entire nation? And tell me, my dear friends, which white president in all of Europe, anywhere you want, not Africa, anywhere you want, would have a black vice president? You can hate America like South Africa, keep saying. Hate America, but I tell you, when it was part of the non-aligned movement, I studied. I'm a politician by heart, so I know what I'm saying. These things are so powerful for the black man to understand what is really going on in our world. You can't take a political statement like that and run with it all over the place. It's in the Bible. You don't need Putin to say that. Read. But you fall in the white Jesus and a white man says he's black and then you believe the white man that says he's black. And then you're writing a whole thing under the statement. Again, I tell you, it's a political statement. That isn't okay for him to go back into Africa and rip the continent. That's what I've been doing. So now I believe it's time to do my lesson. But to continue my lesson. Where was I? Oh, I think I was, uh, I was talking about, so let me tell you, I was talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Every little village in Ethiopia <laughs> 
when you go on the internet, I tell you the internet is good, but it's terrible. Information is so great, but only the fools would rely on everything that they see there. I read what it says. Where they, you're going to tell me some Ethiopian going to go into Israel, take the only oracle that God of Israel, God of Israel, not God of Ethiopia, God of Israel, keep to his people to protect them. To raise where the stones of the commandment only for Israel. Tell me. What kind of Ethiopian would he allow? He just go to one man and get it. Solomon had it, and he took it from Solomon. Go to say, Menelik, it's Solomon's son. So he go and say, Daddy, give me the order. And he said, okay, here it is, son. It belongs to the 12 tribes. It belongs to all Israel. And we are not supposed to talk about it anymore. So why is a professor from Harvard University such a dunce talking about Ethiopia being a holy land. I understand Ethiopia has their own Bible now, their final original Bible. Then I tell you, tell you something. This is a very good advice. Don't read this Bible. Read that one. Read the one that they have in Ethiopia. You can't be quoting this Israelite book. Why are you quoting it? And you're a Rastafari, you're a Christian, what are you? This book belongs to Israelite. It belongs to me. My fathers came on a ship here. That's the point I'm trying to make. So hate me. I don't care. I never had love in the first place. So you can go ahead and, and hate me. But the truth always hurts. And that is why I'm standing up here to tell you the truth. There's somebody else that had the Ark of the Covenant. Did you know that? And I'm going to just read a little bit about those people that had it, just in case. So you get the understanding of what I'm trying to say, that it, it went to Ethiopia and they get all this power, hiding it to some starving little man called a priest, and the making that eye. I tell you when you say that uh, Christianity is not, what do you think the right of the The only difference is them from Christians is the pipe they smoke. That is the sort of body they're temple and they're smoking out. Good, great. Read the Ethiopian Bible that they just find. Don't read an Israelite book and quote from it. Let me tell you the story. Oh, uh, give me a break here because I want everyone that send me all those messages, the conversation I had uh, with a few people. I hope that what I said will clarify all of that. This is my job and I'm doing my job. I don't care what you do. Everybody quotes in the Bible that they belong to it. And they don't see themselves. There's not one Rastafari in there, not one Christian in there, not one Muslim in there. What are you reading it for? They can't find, I can find a lot of Israelites from Genesis to Revelation. I find all the Israelites, and I am an Israelite. Don't let us have that conversation anymore. I'm just talking to you. Let you understand it. They had... something called the Ark of the Covenant. Another set of people had it. And I'm going to read a story. Listen carefully. Because I know you take so much from Elder Shadrach and you twist it around and make it seem like it's yours. I even see a Christian saying, Happy New Year. <laughs> Yeah, you go on your Facebook and you see that. Christians saying Happy New Year. What? Where did they get it from? The Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministry. Or they could go in the Ethiopian Bible. 
Yo, it says here, oh boy, First Samuel, get all your Bibles and stay with me. First Samuel 5, and let's go and have a nice time and end up, because it said, talk about it no more. It's not here. It's all done. It's with Israelites now. We know about it now. We don't have to talk about it. This is the history of it. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Let me tell you about Dagon. Dagon is the god of the Philistines. And it's supposed to be a very powerful god. The third verse says, And when they of Adad arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth, but before the ark of God, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. <sighs> and when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the ground before the ark of God. Before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms. <coughs> That's how we pray. We don't pray like Christians. Everybody used to pray that way. Christians turn it up and put your hands together. Because they don't want your hand to do anything. His hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to it. Yes. Now you're going to have Ethiopians taking it into another land. And got a hungry priest looking at it. It says in the fifth verse, Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the terror soul of Dagon and etch that unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with the emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us. And upon Dagon, our God, they sent before and gathered in the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto God. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emeralds on their sacred parts. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Canaanites cried out, saying, they, they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. <laughs> oh, wow. Let me go, go now to the 11th verse. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place that it stays not and our people. For there was deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not worth smitten with the emeralds and the cry of the city went to heaven. Do you understand what I just read? Yet it's in Ethiopia. God's enemy. Ethiopia and Egypt are the worst of the enemies of God. 
Yet, yet, my brethren, he just came back from Jamaica. There's so many, so many of, of God's people want to be Ethiopians because the Hamite is their God. When he says he's just a man, do you know what? I'll tell you something. He had a dog and he buried a dog and put a cross on the head of the dog. That, that's the God. Let me see what happened with the Ethiopians in the book. Chronicles, the Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 12. And it came to pass when Roboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year, the king of Roboam, as Chalkak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen, and the people were without number, that they came with him out of Egypt, the Lubins, the Soklims, and the Ethiopians, come to fight God's people. I want for you who are listening in Jamaica to listen carefully to what I'm saying. Go to the book of Zephaniah. I'm not just saying there for you to see Zephaniah, the second chapter, the ninth verse, it says, Therefore, as I live, said the Lord of hosts, therefore, as I live, said the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of, of nettles, and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This shall they have to their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will finish, he will furnish rather, he will furnish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship. Men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen, the isles of the Eden. Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain. He shall be slain by my soul. Think about that. Ye Ethiopians, they have woolly hair. The Egyptians had woolly hair. So when you say, I forget to mention that before I start my lesson, people say we shouldn't try, I shouldn't say all these things about Africa. I'm saying a bit about Africa because it's history and it is the truth. It means that if an African comes here, he would still be accepted. If a Gentile comes here, he would still be accepted. If a Chinese come here, he would still be accepted. Anyone that comes to hear the word of God, the word of my God, would be accepted. The Christians knew that. The Muslims knew that. They didn't tell you why they say convert or die. They did it. But when you do it as an Israelite, you're racist. How am I a racist? Because I love my people or because I tell the truth? I'm telling you. I will go to my grave telling the truth because you can't hurt me. The only one can hurt me is like those who heard Jesus right in the 12. And I'm telling you now, it's going to be hard. As I tell you last week, we're not going to say, is it I? Because it will be seen and it will be known. Second Chronicles, the 14th. Again, it says, and Asa, it was a king. And we just have uh, 
our boy here, Asa, called when they're born in the nation, they have, could you understand somebody calling their children in a mall? And they're saying, Samson, Ezekiel, Nathaniel. Come. People would turn around to say, what? That's what we do. We don't name ourselves. Our children that are born in this nation, they have our names. I cannot be born again. That's what somebody asked Jesus if he can enter into his mother's womb again. No, he can't. But I can tell you one thing. Love the God of Israel, and he would guide you into all truth. And it's a cry unto the Lord is from the 11th verse, 2 Chronicles 14. And it's a cry unto the Lord is God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against the multitude. O Lord, O art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Esa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And Esa and the people that were with him pursued him. No, I don't need to read for that. I'm telling you, Ethiopia is God's enemy. For that professor, I don't know where they got the knowledge from, but everybody's so much into Africa. And the people that are into Africa are children of slavery. And they have such a bad memory, they can't see what I'm saying. I got to go to the Gentiles. Oh, Lordy. I hope I have time because if you go to Genesis 10 and you go to the generation, uh, I think in the fourth verse, I don't know if I have it. You go to the fourth verse, you would see that Japheth went to the Isle of the Gentile. And I'm not going to go into all of that because all the people that read the Bible, they have a great idea of what I'm talking about. I want to do something that I've done a very long time ago. Because I told, I told the person, apart from what I did, As elder and leader of this nation, I don't copy from people what they say and what they do, because I do it first, then they copy. When this nation was formed, there was no Hebrew Israelite anywhere. Now, our historians have Rabbi Matthews, who tried to do everything like the Khazars. Then you have Reverend Crowley, I believe his name is. He was a Christian. And those are the two that stand out as being history. And so my grandfather was one. But all they talk about is that the people in the Bible are black. And at that time it was needed because we wanted to know that we are a special people. And we only identify ourselves with the color of our skin. But that's not enough. Because there are others that have woolly hair. There are others that have the color of our skin. And there are enemies. So how come we can only identify ourselves with the color of our skin? There is so much more. When, number one, when the Lord God of my fathers 
took my fathers out from Egypt in a bib. We had to remember that. And by the way, to all of you, I wish you a happy new year, wherever you might be, a very happy new year. And this month is a time for Passover. And I remind you that the first Passover was kept in the wilderness because that's where the feast was. So there's no eggs to bake and no nothing. There's so much ignoramuses everywhere that it's a shame. It's not about them. It's the people who listen to them and have no understanding of what's going on. Please, don't do like what a Gentile do and stop you from reading. Read and see what it is. Otherwise, listen only to Elder Shadrach and his teachings. And again, I tell you about the Hebrew language. I believe you can get a little bit about that uh, later on. But everybody with Shabbat, <laughs> it's, it's such a damn joke. Shabbat, hey, wim. they get all these things and they talk and believe they're so powerful now because they can say Shabbat. Not knowing that that's a Gentile thing. There was no Hebrew language. And I give you an example. My brethren came from Jamaica. They speak English, but I couldn't understand. That was a Jamaican town. It wasn't Jamaican language. I talk about my brethren in England, lived there for about over 60 years, and still sound like a Guyanese, where I was born. So I don't understand how people running around in nice fancy clothes and shouting Shabbat. And so proud of it. Jesus' name is this, Jesus' name. Oh, and there's no J, so they couldn't be. Uh, I told you this already, to those of you who are intelligent, not the stupid ones, those of you who are intelligent, you need to understand that Jesus never spoke English. So when you transform from one language to the next, if I know a little bit of Hindi, because I'm from Guyana, Bartan needs dishes. But Bartan in Hindi is B. I got my means mother. Most of them could be M. That's the difference. Then you have amigo, Spanish. It means friend, F. So forget it. When people are telling you there's no J, and J is 600 years, and he born 2,000 years, and again, more ignoramuses. He never spoke, he spoke Aramaic, he spoke all these languages that our fathers used to be speaking. For instance, in Guyana, a boat that is born with wood is called a balahu. It's English, but you can't find it nowhere because it's, it's a black town. If a timber falls, it's called a tabuka. Takuba. That's their tongue. There's no, no, no particular language because they're talking English, but they're black. In Southern America, they talk, used to talk differently, but now I understand they're all organized. They used to sing differently, talk differently. We had soul music was totally different from other music. So where you get Hebrew language from? I'm going to have somebody to come up here later on, and they are going to tell you about Hebrew languages. Oh boy, I see like I get about half an hour. Yeah. And I have about an hour, so I've got to make sure 
Okay, there's something that I have to do that I did years ago. Uh, but I was asked, they said, Elder Shadrach, you just did two lines of Ephesians. How you expect for me to understand two lines, who's talking to who? I picked that book because I, that's the first book I taught to, to, excuse me, to the priests so that they can understand the difference. So I'm going to talk to you about it now. It's in a Latin on a tape somewhere. I don't know where. But I'm going to go, and I'm going to let you try to understand how easy it is and how difficult it is for the ignoramuses to understand bad Israelites are Gentiles. And if you see the amount of people that understand that, no, I can't say understand it, that believe it because they have no understanding. I'm going to go over again with Ephesians, the second chapter. I notice my time is going very quickly. And the person that's coming up has a lot of information. So I'm going to go to Ephesians 2. I want for you to find it with me and go through it with me. Let's go bit by bit, and I'm going to explain it. It says, this is what I read the last time, and you said I only read two lines. Ah, boy, oh boy. I can imagine what Moses went through in the wilderness. Oh, you talk to God, we didn't get no food. We missed the cucumber and the leek. Who wants leek? <laughs> ah. Everybody find a way. Is that a, a way to get me back up here? Or it's just having the blood of the old Israelites. So you complain. And you, first of all, let me explain this to you. The writer here is Paul. And Paul is an Israelite, born in Tarsus. Knows everything about being an Israelite. He wasn't an apostle. That he was given to teach the Gentiles. And I'm telling you now, when that happened on the road to Damascus, everything was transformed. So he had to go to work. He had to do like me. I can't go to Hollywood anymore. I'm, number one, I'm too old now. So I have to stay here and do God's work. I got a harder job to do than Paul because he had to teach just Gentiles. I teach him the devil and everybody. But nobody understands what's going on. Now remember this, the writer is an Israelite. Paul. It says, and you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And I stopped there. And they asked me to explain. And I said, you're right, it needs more explanation. First, you got to understand the children of disobedience are now following, as it says in the book of Romans. Somebody asked me to read Romans 9, 1 to 5, but I might do that later before I go. But Romans 11 tells you about the root. We follow the Gentiles in whatever they do. They used to worship the power of the air. Now we are worshiping it. We have the white Jesus on our dinner table. We pray with our hands clasped. We do all those crazy things. 
can sometimes we turn to another religion and do, do we only want to know that, uh, uh, sorry, there's no other religion but Israel. You turn to another philosophy, there's no man that made this religion. Every philosophy was formed and made by man. That was the first and second verse of Ephesians, the second chapter. I'm going to go on. The third verse says, Among whom also we, now remember when the word we, plural, it is saying that together now, both Israel and who are we talking to now, I know Gentile, but I have to prove that to you. It says we. It says, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the loss of our flesh. It means we talk about ordinary things. Loss of our flesh is what we talk about. It's what you young men talk about. You know, you have that, you have that, oh, we brothers, we talk about the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. This is what we're talking about. And of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. This is conversation or discourse that we're having together. But God, who's rich in mercy, according to what it says here, who's rich in mercy, for his great in love, Wherewith he loved us. Us. We're not together now. Now listen to how it is written. God in his mercy love us. We Israelites. Don't put it together. Love us. Even when we were dead. We. Plural. To persona. To us. And when we were dead. Israelite, because he's talking about himself. I want for you to look at it as a writer. Even when we, again we go, even when we were dead in sins, I quickened us together with Christ. The next line says, and I'm telling you, by grace are you saved. By grace, you are saved. We are not saved by grace. By grace, you are saved, Gentiles. Let me go on. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not heaven. Heavenly places could even mean the knowledge that we have, like the Israelite nation. We're together. It doesn't matter what you look like. Bring us together. But he's saying to the Gentiles, you are saved by grace. Let's go on to read. The seventh verse says, I hope you're taking a note of what I'm saying. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward all of us through Christ Jesus, through us. Because it said it together in this, this in the verse before. Now he's saying by grace you were saved, but uh, for by grace are you saved again in the eighth verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. We are saved by faith. Oh, about goodness. Uh, I wonder who would understand this. We are saved by grace. It says in the eighth verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And who has the gifts? We do. It, this is so technical. This is like my biographer. The way how she writes, I don't think 
the fools will be able to understand it because she's so classy with words. This is like Du Bois. It's only, I don't know, only people who are rich in the spirit will be able to understand this. For by grace are you saved in the adverse. Through faith, not by faith. I'm getting to that. Not of works. It means <laughs> you don't have to keep the Passover. You don't have to do nothing. We do all the work. How do you understand something like this? And you run around this with a Christian Bible running. Sorry, did I say Christian Bible? What's the matter with me today? You run around with this Bible saying you're a Christian. Listen carefully what I'm saying because I have the authority. You don't. It says, eight, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not saved by doing anything. We do the work. For our his work, oh my goodness. Uh, you know what? This is so powerful, yet to the dummies it wouldn't make any sense. It says, for we, no, look, let me go back to nine. You're not saved by works. And you're saved through faith. Because we got to give you the faith. We got to give you grace. We got to give it to you. We teach you. And we lead you in the path. And it says, in the ninth verse again, not of works. You don't need to do anything. We do all the work. We kill the lamb. We have the Passover. We do everything. We work. We break the building down. We do that. We make it bigger. For we are his workmanship. You know, I can close the book, but I'm not. Listen to this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Notice the Christ is all before Jesus in a certain way because you've got to understand it. Unto good works which God before God before ordained. A long time God ordained it that we should walk in them. My dear friends, I don't know how else to clear this. I'm not coming to you, but Jesus love you and all this garbage you always talk and says come from the Bible. Listen carefully what the Bible is saying and try to understand who can be your teacher. It says in the 11th verse, wherefore, remember that you, therefore, remember that you, being in the past Gentiles, in the flesh, You are Gentiles in the flesh. Mean you're not like us. It's not no bad as a like being Gentiles. You are Gentile in the flesh. You look different. Your culture is different. Everything is different. You're Gentiles in the flesh. Genesis 10:4. We talk about Japheth. First of all, you gotta remember. The Bible says, and it's happening today. I remember the verse that I got to read. It's happening today. The Bible says in Genesis 9, the 27th verse, it says that Japheth would inherit the land. Japheth would inherit our land after we've been thrown out because of our disobedience. Japheth would inherit. So who do you think is there? The Gentiles. I didn't say that, the Bible did. 
Genesis 9:27. I don't know what else you need for me to tell it to you. But it's there. It says, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Uh, are you seeing the Bible? You got to believe the Bible because it is happening. Look what's happening. Japheth, they believe that they're Israel. Remember, that land was called Canaan. When we left there, it was called Palestine. The English and everybody has called it Israel. I'm trying to tell you, those of you who are so ignorant. Now, ignorance is not a bad word. It simply means you don't know anything. Uh, that at that time you were without Christ, the 12th verse. Did, did you read what it says in the 11th verse? Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision. By that we call you, by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands made by hands because we were the only people who were supposed to be circumcised. But because the smell was 13, 14, the Muslims said they had to do it. They didn't get the law. We had it. So they've taken everything that we had and given us false gods. Japheth is now in Israel. Japheth is in our land. And I'll tell you something else. We traveled from land to land. And when we travel like we do now, we come from the Caribbean, we come from Brazil, we come from all these places, and we line up to go to Egypt. And we have Barabbas who's saying, uh, we can't, you're going to change your life, you become president. Nobody can come. You have a good president. Everybody says, even my people says he's too old. They can't see. But what could you do? They're looking at what people are saying. They're not looking what he's doing. When Jesus is there, he says, uh, give us Barabbas. We don't want, now, or don't go tomorrow morning and say I'm calling by the Jesus. I know you're black people, all you want to do is criticize. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have a good man, but you want Barabbas. The 12th verse says, Though at that time you were without Christ, we have him now. The Bible is saying it. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Aliens mean far, far away from our country. And strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was these people. How did they become so powerful? They say, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off and made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall I hope you understand that now. We have broken down the middle wall of partition. Ah. And I built up the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building filthy frame together grow it into one holy temple in the Lord. Oh boy. I have about five minutes. I hope the other person come up here very quickly and finish the job. I was talking about the next thing I had to talk about is language and tongues through the scriptures because I talk about it outside from the scriptures. But the Shadrach never says anything that is not in the scriptures. I tell you what it says in Genesis 11 and the old earth was a one language. Now tell me something. God confounded all the language. Why are you telling me I got to learn some stupid Gentile language so I can praise God? Are you telling me what I'm saying now God would not understand? I'm telling you you're a liar. I don't have to say Shabbat Elohim and all of that. Nope. He understands full well because I see his miracles. When I pray to my father, I see that my, I'm still alive. And I'm here because the God of my father is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob decide that he's going to keep me a little longer. So don't tell me I got to know another language and call the language holy. Where did you do that research to find that? These are the sons of Ham, after the families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nation. The 31st verse in Genesis 10. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, their lands, after their nation. So I explain what tongues mean totally different from, I don't think I can do a holy name. Everybody, all the priests would say, pray in his holy name, and they don't even know his holy name. Oh, I have a couple of minutes more. I could read some psalms for you. It says, for our hearts, I'm told the tree 21, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Psalm 103, once I bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Psalm 105, 3 says, glory in the holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. What is his holy name? When David was praying in the temple, what it says in Romans 6, he called in his holy name, but I can't do that now because I have to go. And I would say to you, you can call me, but when you call me, say that you understood. Don't try to, you can't condemn what I say. Anyone that disagree with me, it, they're not disagreeing with my message. They're disagreeing because they don't like me. I speak the truth. And that is the power that my God has given unto me. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemies be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. 
my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Peace, everyone. Wow. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to another session with the Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries. Actually, I should say Happy New Year. Happy Abib, Happy New Moon. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> well, it's just been so amazing. And as I stand here before you today, I am truly humbled and deeply honoured to even share the same stage as our very own Elder Shadrach. What a privilege it is to follow after him. This is a man of wisdom, strength and faith for the Israelite nation worldwide ministries. And our elders message today has been a testament of his profound wisdom, his unwavering commitment to the truth and his ability to guide us along this path of righteousness. And it's very important when I think about our elder, I think about Proverbs 29 and in it, it says, verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And our elder Shadrach is truly a visionary leader. So today, what can I say? This was just so fascinating. Our elder Shadrach, before I go into my lesson, before I go into my message, shall I say, I want to talk to you about the Hebrew language. Uh, okay, here is my notes. It's very important. I want to make sure that I have everything here. So you've, you've just heard our elder, what he talked about when, when it comes to the, the Hebrew language. And it's, that's quite an oxymoron because there's no such thing. Anyways, first of all, I just want to say that, you know, a few weeks ago, I watched this video and it said, the ancient Israelites spoke the Hebrew language. So I was like, okay, really, let's, let's see this. So I was watching it and this guy, he's, he's not a bad researcher, you know, he goes back in time, I think he went to the 1800s and 1900s and he pulled up all these references and he spoke about, you know, the, the black people being in the land and how they were moved to certain parts of, you know, the, the Western Africa, the typical things, things that we know. Then he pulled up this one reference and I didn't take down the details and I was, I, in my mind I was saying, you know, I'm going to go back there just to take the details, just, just because. And so he reads this part and it says something to the point of this explorer or whatever. He acknowledged or he wrote that the people, the Israelites, they spoke Arabic, Hebrew, the Hebrew language and another language. I, I can't even remember what it was. And then he was... It, you know, there, there was music and he just like slammed the book almost and, and it's like, there, see? So this person, apparently back in the 1800s or the early 1900s, whenever it was, he wrote this thing. Well, let me tell you something. I don't care if you have a degree, if you have all kinds of knowledge, if you've been around the world a million times, if you've researched back to the time of Adam, the fact remains, you can write down anything. You can say that the, you know, you can look up any reference you want where it says that the ancient Israelites spoke the Hebrew language. And I will tell you to your face that you are a liar. Because first and foremost, see this book? This is the KJV Bible. And those that claim to read this book, as my elder said earlier, this book was written about Israelites, for Israelites, by Israelites. And if you took the time out and went through each of these pages, actually, you don't even have to do that. Just go and Google it. Go and Google it. Go to one of those online Bibles. Just make it easier for yourself and type in Hebrew language, because this is what we're talking about. 
We're not talking about anything else. We're not talking about the Spanish language or the Assyrian language. We're not talking about anything else, but we are talking about the Hebrew language. And I guarantee you, I will bet you that you will not find any reference in this book to the Hebrew language. You may find the Hebrew tongue, and as our elder so rightly said, a tongue is easily demonstrated by, for example, those that are in Jamaica. They speak English, they speak the English language, but their tongue is a Jamaican tongue. Or you may have a Bajan tongue, you may have an English tongue. It's how you speak, the expressions you use. But there is no such thing as the Hebrew language. So I do the mic drop right here, right? There you go. So you could go reference your 1800s or whatever and pick up all kinds of people that say it's Hebrew language. But I go according to this book. This book, which is the book of truth, and if you say that you're a person of the book, then you would not be disputing me because when you go here, you will see that there is no such thing as the Hebrew language. And just so that we have a clear understanding, I'm going to go over Mr. Eliezer Ben Yahuda just a little bit, just so that you understand exactly where this is coming from. And I try to flush it out a little bit more, okay? So first of all, we look at the fact that he changes his name. This to me is beautiful because Moses had an Egyptian name and he did not go and change his name just to identify himself with his people. He knew who he was. And even our elder, our Moses of today, he's got a Babylonian name, but did he change his name? No. Look at that. To me, that's just like brilliant. But this person who claims to have developed the Hebrew language, well, technically speaking, the Israeli Hebrew language, he changed his name. His original name was Eliezer Yitzhak, Yitzhak Perliman, and he was born in Lithuania. Now, anyone who knows a little bit of geography will realize that Lithuania, once upon a time, was part of the USSR, which is Russia. It was part of Russia once upon a time. So this man from Russia comes out, he changes his name, and many of my people that look like me decide that in order to understand this book, as our elder just said, they go and they change their name. Okay, all right, fair enough, go ahead, do, do your thing. But as Israelites, we don't do that. Secondly, just before he arrived in Palestine, he started to write about this idea of developing a language for the Jews, he said the Jews. But we know it's, it's for his people. And when did he go to Palestine? When did he begin this whole process of changing the language or developing this Israeli Hebrew language? Ebi, I'm gonna call it Ebi, okay? So when I say Ebi, I'm referring to what they call today the Hebrew language. And as I said before in time past, that Ebi was a term that was coined by our very own Elder, Sha sorry, Elder Andal. He coined that term, which is uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, Ebi, okay? So bear with me, okay? So don't lose me here, right? So he arrived in Palestine in 1881. That's less than 200 years ago. So he's developing, he's moved to Palestine, and at this time as well, many Ashkenazi and Khazars from the region of Ru Russia, the, Be the Baltic region, they were all moving to Palestine at this time. There was a whole load of them moving to Palestine at this time. And while he was there, he instructed what he was developing as the Hebrew language and teaching it to his son. Right? So at that time, you imagine that what they call Hebrew or Ebi today, 
it was only him and his son that were speaking it. Now he created all these terms, over 5,000, there's probably more now, but over 5,000 different terms for everyday words. And again, I think to myself, so you've taken what is technically speaking uh, a holy language or a, a holy expression, a holy tongue, and you're turning it into everyday items like doll, dog food, toilet paper, and you're saying that this is a, he this is a holy language. Okay, there's a problem with that. So he does this. Then he develops a school, and in the school, everybody's learning this new way of speaking. One of the things that really troubled me, and Elder mentioned this earlier, one of the things that really troubled me about this whole process, and this is what some of you want to take on. If you look back in history, during the time of Christ, of Jesus the Christ, he spoke Aramaic. That was the language at the time. Our forefathers spoke the language of the land that they were living in based on the people that were there. That's the language that they spoke. They needed to communicate. They weren't there trying to develop a, uh, their own thing and they weren't trying, you know, oh, we're going to keep this just to ourselves for hundreds and thousands of years. No, it didn't work that way. They were moved. They were taken into captivity. They were enslaved for hundreds of years here and there and everywhere. So how are they going to still speak a language when they were so dispersed? Okay. Here is the irony. He eliminated Aramaic from the Hebrew, from the Israelite, from, sorry, from the Hebrew language, the, the today's so-called Hebrew language. He eliminated Aramaic. This is the, the, the tongue, this is the, the language that was spoken by our forefathers, but he eliminated it. Do you see that separation? And you're still going to cling on to this so-called Hebrew language? He eliminated one of the fundamental languages, removed it completely. Any notion of it, he removed, cleansed it. And again, not only did he remove it, not only did he remove Aramaic, it has strong Russian influence. So this new form of Hebrew has new, has Russian influence. It is Yiddish, it is Germanic, it is Slavic. It is everything but what our forefathers spoke. And I don't know how to make that more clear. It's everything but what our forefathers spoke. And again, as I said before, they developed a, a council. They, you know, it was a, became an official language in 1922, right? So looking at all of this, I want to really ask you, would you still go ahead and claim to be learning Hebrew in order to communicate, as our elder said, with our God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Come on, guys. Seriously, this is our God. He is a great God. He knows all. He's seen all. He can understand whatever he wants to, whenever he feels like it. He created the heavens. He created the earth, everything that's there. And you think he's going <laughs> to, it's almost like a trick. It's like, oh, in order to know me, you have to know Hebrew. No, he says, in order to know me, you've got to worship me in spirit, spirit and in truth. This is what we're about, spirit and truth. Not about going to find a, a, a tongue that has no association with our forefathers. None at all. So again, I ask you, are you going to cling onto this so-called Hebrew language? Think twice. You claim that you, you read this book and you believe in this book. Like I said, find the Hebrew language. And it's not like the book doesn't refer to language. 
it refers to language. It will tell you about the Greek's language or the, or the Syrian's language. It will tell you about that. But it never said anything about the Hebrew language. So I hope that clears that up. I know it probably doesn't. And I know somebody's going to still come out there and as Zelda says, they're going to say, what, Shabbat Shalom. You know, those are actually Yiddish terms that were actually converted from Arabic terms. Anyways, do that research. It's out there. So, talking about our creator, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the creator of heaven and earth, guess what? He is so phenomenal, so incredible, so wow, that he created the seasons. Simple. Everything knows what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. And when you go out there in the world, I'm going to appeal to those who are gardeners out there because you're going to help me with this today. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to go into an area. You know, as much as I, I love the flowers, I'm, a, I'm not really keen on worms and little things that crawls around, but I do love the idea of herbs and flowers and plants growing. So I get my sons and my husband to do all of that fun stuff. But I really do appreciate it. And I do understand the concept of a gardener. I do. I really appreciate them. Elder Elaine, phenomenal. You should see the backyard during the summer times. There's Callaloo to Kingdom Come. You know, there's all kinds of peppers and cucumbers and everything. Anyways, but I want to go and look at the concept of the garden. So I want you to take your time and use your imagination because like I said, I'm a very visual person and this is going to come into play. So let us begin by remembering the perfect garden God created for, for mankind. Let's turn to Genesis. And in Genesis 2, 8 to 10, it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Do you see how it all comes together? He created this garden, this beautiful garden. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So already we have a beautiful seed. Imagine the oak tree and the fir tree and the silver birch, all these different trees out there in a the garden. And it's pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Wait, wait. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. You can't do anything without the water. Oh my goodness, it's always there. And from thence, it was parted and became into four heads. And when we go on to read in Genesis, we hear about the gold and the beryl and the onyx, all in that region as well. And the soil is rich and the man was made from that soil that was in Eden. Could you imagine that soil? So you look at our father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and God of Jacob. He was a gardener. He was an artist. And he went and he created this beautiful scene and he created man out of that beautiful structure. Do you see that? And he's taken this rich soil with all these rich minerals and he created this man and he put him in the garden to tend to his garden. So that man became the constant gardener. He learned the trees, he learned the names of the herbs and everything. So everything was in perfect harmony between God and his creation. And this, if we understood this, this was right at the beginning. See, I didn't start halfway through the book. I'm starting right at the beginning. I'm taking you back to the beginning, back to basics. So this should serve as a model for our own spiritual lives. Do you see that connection? 
So as we embark on this new year, let us take a moment and assess the state of our spiritual garden. Now we're going to have some real fun, right? We're looking at our own spiritual garden. Now we're going to have to put on some gloves here, you know, get out the rakes, get out the, I don't even know what all the tools are called, the little snipping th tool, you know, Elder, is it Elder Elvis? He's good at this as well. I'm telling you, whatever he touches, it just grows. It's like, whoa. So you've got to get out all these little gardening tools, right? Because now we're dealing with our spirituality. And again, look at the time and the season. Look at that. To me, it's just like so incredible. This is a time of newness. As I said before, the water was there to soften the grounds, to feed the trees and the herbs. But the water, we had showers, April showers. What does that do? It softens the ground. It's starting to prepare the ground, right? Because this is springtime. This is our new year. This is a bib. So the grounds are nice and soft. So this you take your little rake and now you start to till that ground, that beautiful soil. You start to turn it over and start to prepare it. Right? This is your spirituality. This is us. Remember the God of Israel, he says, remember, this is the month. This is the month that you've got to start preparing yourself for something to come. Something big. This is, this is an eternal history. You never forget this. You nor your generations after you. Because this is what the God of Israel has put forth for his children to get them ready. It's New Year's. It's not just about partying and having a feast and getting dressed up and looking good. And I can't wait. <laughs> but it's about preparing ourselves, preparing our mind mentally to go into that moment of Passover. So you start to rake it. You start to rake that mind, start to... to Get that ground ready. And that's so important as well because, like I said, this is our spiritual garden. And we are cultivating not just our faith, but our wisdom and obedience. Unfortunately, and this is a, this is a good time to take an assessment of the kind of ground that you have around you. Because not all the time the grounds are good to plant. Sometimes you have to leave one for seven years and then or rotate it every year. Or, I don't know, you guys are gardeners, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't just plant and plant and plant and you know, and sometimes you've just got to be careful because something somebody else might plant in your garden. But let's let's go to Galatians and you'll see what I'm saying. So Galatians 6, 7 to 8, and it says here, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For, if, for he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall reap, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So we have to be careful, you know, it's, it's not all just fun and games. And that's why, you know, you can't just go out there and start planting and, you know, just like take a seed and start, you know, putting it in the soil. You've got to germinate the soil, I mean the seeds, you know, you've got to wait, make sure that it starts to sprout so that you know the seed is alive and then you put it in the ground. So the, it, it takes time. There is certain knowledge that you need, but that's required, especially when we're talking about our spiritual life. That spiritual garden that we have, we need to know the kind of seeds that we're going to be planting in our garden. Because we might be sowing the seed of corruption. We might be sowing the seed that doesn't benefit anyone, not even ourselves. And I'm telling you, when you look at the scripture, you'll see that the plant, the growing, the gardening, the tilling of the soil, all of this is very relevant, especially to this time of the year that we're at. And so we're going to have a treat. We're going to go into Matthew 13 and we're going to start from three. So let me just bring it up right here because, oh yes, okay. So yeah. Matthew 13, 
And he spake many things unto them in parables. So who is he? He, Christ, right? And he's speaking to the multitude. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, this is one of the parables. A sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed some seeds, and I know many of you are very familiar with this, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. So there wasn't a lot of earth there, right? And forthwith they sprung up. So it was so superficial. It's like, oh yes, I love the God of Israel. I serve the God of Israel. And they, you know, they're all into it. So they sprung up and you, they just seemed like, oh yeah, they're so into this. And because they had no deepness of earth there was no depth in them they were so shallow there's no depth and when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root there were there was no root everything was so superficial how many people have you seen in your life that just comes by and and you think to yourself oh my gosh they really get this they really know what they're talking about and then you don't see them anymore it's like huh geez that was uh that wasn't very deep, was it? And so they withered away, and some fell among thorns. And these are the hard ones, right? So they fall among thorns, and the thorns just sprung up and just choked them. It's like they just fell into the wrong place. It's like, yes, okay, uh, and then they get captured with all the probably problems of the world you know this is happening you know my wife this and my husband that and shopping and bills and everything and it's like where where where, where are you guy and so they're gone but others fell into good ground and they bought forth fruit some an hundredfold some sixtyfold some 30 fold and it says here who has ears to hear let them hear now this parable teaches us the the importance of preparing our hearts to receive and nurture the seed of truth and so we must cultivate good soil so you see that it could be stony ground you know is your mind stony ground i'm sorry this is the, the comparison that we're having. I'm not saying that, you know, your mind is full of stones, but I'm just saying, imagine, is your mind stony ground? Is it shallow? Is there no depth in your mind? How deep does that seed go? When you receive the word, does it make you ponder and wonder and look up to the heavens and imagine and read and go and do more research? Or do you like, oh my gosh, this is so great, God of Israel, yeah, yeah, you know, brethren, and wow. And then you walk out the, the door and you don't know who you are anymore because you've just gone off with somebody who's, oh yeah, let's go down to, to this shrine or let's go and do this or let's go on vacation. It's like everything's just like forgotten. That's a shadow mind. And it happens, and I've seen many people that way. And it's unfortunate. But that's why you need to make sure that you prepare that ground. And this is the time. You know, this is the time of New Year's, but it's also going into a very highly spiritual time. And you can't just jump into that time. You know, you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to, you've got to get in the mode. You, you've got to understand the fundamentals of gardening, of tilling your soil before you can even take that step. And even that step is not a guarantee, but it's a step nonetheless. And it's an opportunity to prepare that soil. So, okay. So we read from Matthew, we read from Matthew 13, three to nine. But I want to go on a little bit more because I think it's very important for us to get the essence of what's going on. Because you know what? Jesus the Christ 
when he speaks, he speaks in parables to everybody. But as it says here, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And when, it's from 10, it says here, and, and the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is not given unto, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. They don't have the right kind of soil to receive this message, but you need to have this soil. For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. So, and this is what, you know what? It is so important. And I know many of my brethren have been saying it of late and I completely agree that when you have, you've got to work this. You know, in order for it to multiply and to become abundant, you have to work at it. You have to work at it. And it says, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away even that he has. So wow, that's actually quite terrifying. It's like, geez, you don't have, but it's gonna be even taken away. So it's like, you grab a little bit, but nothing happens. And then not, even, not only is that taken away, but more taken away. Ooh, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen, see not. They might say, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I understand. But you don't see them come back here. Do they really understand? If they did, they would be here. If they really did. So they don't see. So those who say and they don't do, they really don't. They don't know, they, do, they, they don't see. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. How could you understand? If you say that you understand, oh yeah, I hear you, I hear you, man. I, I hear what you're saying, Officer Shami. I get you, I heard you. But you didn't come. <laughs> you didn't come. I gave you the address. I, I, I gave you a little invita invitation. Where are you? You said you understand. I get you, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, man, I know that. And you'll speak for hours. Yeah, man, yeah, yeah, I just like this, yeah. And you think you're getting a connection. Yeah, wow, this is so awesome. And you get so excited and it's like, tick tock, tick tock. The breeze is going. So where are you? What happened? I thought, I thought we were on the same level here. Yeah, man, but I just had to go, you know, I, ha I had to go to, to deliver this thing. Or, yeah, I had to go into my job. I'm going to come next week. Okay, all right, all right, I'll see you then. But I'm not going to hold my breath because even though my favorite color is blue, I don't want to turn blue, right? So I'm not going to hold my breath. And then maybe three months down the road, we don't even talk scriptures anymore. How you doing? How's the children? How's the wife? How's the husband? How's everything? How's the sky, the moon, the sun, the sea, everything? We don't even talk scriptures anymore. Okay, I get it. I get it. It says, it says here, they hear not. Right? That's exactly it. Neither do they understand because all that talk, all that beautiful words that they string together like a string of pearls was imitation. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Elias, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. That is just so sad. Anyways, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. You see, you see the glory of God. You see Psalms 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, sometimes, sometimes you just know how you're going to feel when you look at certain things. Like when I go by the sea and I look at it and it's like, I know it's gonna get to me and it just gets to me. And it's so deep and it's like, why is this happening again? It's like, I see it every day or every whatever, but it still gets to you. 
because the heavens declare the glory of God and the feminine show of its handiwork. And you read the scriptures day unto day, our true speech and night unto night show of knowledge. Oh my gosh, this is just so incredible. This is the work of our father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And when I say it, when I'm on a, in the plane and I'm flying and just like, I just came in just yesterday and I'm, I'm on the plane and I'm seeing the clouds and I'm thinking to myself, you know, the formation of the clouds today, because this is not every day, but the formation of the clouds, it looks like desert. But the difference is, this is alive. This is the firmament. This is the first firmament. This is the first creation of the God of Israel. This is water. This is life. This is the essence of life. And as much as it looks like the desert, it is life. The desert is not the same. It is hot and it's spiteful. If you've ever been on there, the sun could get hot and it could get so spiteful that you're seeing things and hallucinating. And what do you need? You need the first firmament to keep you in balance, to keep you in check. And this is what I see. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, I'm witnessing this. And you know what's, you know what's even more emotional? It's known that this is the hand of the handiwork of my father. And I'm thinking to myself, this is so incredible, crazy, insane. Nobody understands that. Because they see, but they cannot comprehend, they cannot perceive what they see. The creation of the God of Israel. This is his work. And it's so perfect and beautiful. And as you look out into infinity, it doesn't end. It just keeps going. And all that's left is your own imagination because it's just so incredible. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Elias, which saith, by hearing they shall hear not. They shall hear, shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have closed, lest at any time they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should, not, and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, so he's speaking to his apostles, Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear because you're here, because you're with me, because you, you want, you thirst for more. You want your seeds to be beautiful. You want to know how to prune the seed, how to make it right, how to make it perfect. That's why you're here. You want, you want, you want instructions. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. That's why it's important to be a constant gardener. You can't just plant the seeds and say, oh, yes, that's a good tree that I'm planting there and that's going to be a beautiful tree. If you don't watch it, somebody's just going to come and take it away. The birds are going to come, snip, gone. It's gone. That word, that beautiful word, that perfect seed, that righteous seed was just planted and it's gone because you didn't look at it. You didn't continue to cultivate. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, well, you might as well forget it. The same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy received it. Yes. Yet has he no not root in himself but endureth for a while. For when tri tribulations and persecutions ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. 
Where are you guys? You said you understood. So why, why you all of a sudden you've gone off because somebody said, oh, whatever, whatever it is they said, I don't know, some crazy thing. Like God is black. <laughs> whatever. You know, and they're offended. It's like, oh my goodness. Oh, those people, listen to what they're talking about. Hold on a sec, we had, we had something going before, but now you're gone. He also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. So he hears the word, he's like, yeah, I'm going to be with you. Yeah, man, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. Trust me, when I say these things, we've heard them. We've heard every single word. We've, we've seen people that's like, yeah, you know, I've prayed about this. I cried and I did this. And, you know, they're crying and it's, and it's, and your heart is like, oh my gosh, this is, this is such a powerful testimony. And they go off. And their mother said this to them, or they had to go to a nightclub. And then the following week, they had to go to another club. And then, you know, uh, sorry, I couldn't get time off work. And then you have to go away. And then it's like, as I said before, where are they? Where are they? You know, and, and then a little bit of hardship. Oh, you know, I have to work. I, I've got to work. It's like, we've all got to work. <laughs> you know, no, nobody's getting this for free. We've all got to work. But at the end of the day, it's like the cares of the world. It's about paying the bills. It's about getting to work. It's about traveling. It's about, you know, hanging out with mom, dad, brother, sister, cousin, auntie, uncle, lover, whatever. It's all about everything except this truth. So all the turbulation, all the persecution, they come and it's like, you know what? I, I'll come. I'm going to come. You, you watch. Watch the doors, I'm going to come. But like I said, my colour is blue, but at the end of the day, I don't want to turn blue, so I'm not going to hold my breath, okay? Anyways, it says here, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So you don't see him, you don't see, you don't see any works, nothing. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word. Not only did it, you hear it, not only did you hear it, because this is a, a you've got to take this in steps, and understand it. You understand the word. You hear the word and you understand it. It's like, it moves you. It's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible which also bear a fruit because you, you, you've heard this and you want to go and tell the world. You want to go and, oh my goodness, I want the world to know. I want everybody, every, how come everybody doesn't know this truth? It is so incredible. It makes me shiver every time I hear this. Every time I hear a testimony, it makes me cry or jump for joy. This is the word and it's deep and it's beautiful. And you want to share it. And that's the beauty about when you receive this. You don't want to keep it to yourself. You don't just like hide it. When you have a beautiful garden, you want to show, like, look, it's nice, isn't it? It's nice, right? Green. Yeah, yeah. You see, oh, yeah, I planted that last year. And look, it came back again this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, lavender. <laughs> it smells the bomb. Yeah, yeah. It makes my whole area smell nice here. So you want to share this. It's like you want, me, you want me to show you how? You want a piece? You want a piece, you know? So you want to share this, right? Because the truth is just so incredible. You don't want to just hide it. You're not going to hide it in the dungeon or in, in a dark room. No, you want to put it out there so the sun could smile down and the rain could do its thing. And then you can just look back. You, you remember what the God of Israel said? You know, after, he, after all this beautiful, this garden that he created, he looked back and like, yeah, man. Yeah, this is really nice. This is really good. So you imagine he's doing this. 
first example, how much more when we understand what's actually written here, when we learn to cultivate the soil of our own minds, of our own souls, we learn to cultivate that soil and we start to plant it with the right seed that start to germinate into beautiful flowers and plants. So he that receives the good seed uh, the, on the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Man, that is incredible. That to me is, that is the essence of who we are and what it is that we are supposed to do. And like I said, this is the perfect time to understand the beginning of things. Elder said, from the scriptures, we were taken out to serve the God of Israel. We were taken out to keep his Sabbath day. It was, we were, this is what, this is our duty that, to serve the God of Israel. And it took place in this time. So we've got to prepare our minds. We've got to prepare our minds to take us back to the time when our God, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac and God of Jacob, he destroyed Egypt with a mighty right hand. He had those people annihilated. He showed his miracles like none other ever before. And you imagine when the people, they are walking, they are walking. They are standing next to Moses because they are afraid for their life. They have to depend on the shepherd, on Moses, who is the constant gardener of the people back then, who had to lead the way. They had to depend on him because, look, it's terrifying to see those walls of water. And you're walking through and you've got the enemy behind you. And you're walking, it's like, you know they're praying all the way. They're not, they're not, <laughs> they're not idle chit-chatting, yeah, when I get to Canaan land, yeah, this is going to happen, and yeah, we're going to pray. No, they are praying. It's like, God of Israel, you know, you said you're going to help us. You better help us. And, you know, I'm so scared. You know, I've got my flock with me. I've got my wife, my children. You know, they are praying all, they are praying on that journey. I'm telling you, they are praying on that journey when they are walking that, that, that path that path of dry ground, they are praying. They, they, they have nothing else to think about but the God of Israel because he is their savior. And they are walking in that path. They are following the instructions. There is no if, ands and buts in this point in time because you heard that none of them were lost, not in that path, not one of them were lost. So you know they were following the instructions to the T because they want to see that other side. You know, that path that didn't seem to end because it just went like this. You, you see that perspective and it's like, I don't see no tree, I don't see no land, <laughs> but I know what we got to walk because the enemy is behind us and Moses said to go this way. So you're walking, it's like, I pray, I pray that the land is coming soon. And they walk in and it's like, oh gosh, I, I can't see the tree yet. So it's like, how far do we have to go? <laughs> it's like... You know, it's like, come on, Johnny, you, you Jonathan, you got to walk, you got to come on, you got to move those little legs of yours, you know. <laughs> I could only carry you so far. I'm telling you, they are walking and praying to get to that other side. And if you, if you don't believe me, then you try taking a zip line, you know, from one mountain to another. Trust me, you'll be praying. You're not thinking about, oh, this is wonderful. I, I'm flying. No, you're praying. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I speak for myself. I'm praying because it's like, okay, I'm going through Psalms 1, 23, 24, 25, 6, 7, everything. I'm doing Psalms I didn't even know I know. I'm, I've, all of a sudden it's there and I, I, I could recite them. And it's like with the pledge and everything to go with it because I want to get to that other side safely. So <laughs> even some songs in there, just throw a few songs in there, you know. Thank you, God of Israel. <laughs> you know. I want to get there safely, so I'm bringing it all out, okay? It's like, Father, you're going to hear me today because it's all coming out. So when we are talking about cultivating our garden, cultivating the soul, cultivating the soil of our soul, soul, 
we are looking at Galatians 5. If we go to Galatians 5, it says, this is beautiful because you understand when I'm saying this is not a coincidence that everything is all related to gardening. You know, even the God of Israel is like, I am the husbandman. It's like, you know, we talk about the, the, the vine and the vineyard and we always talk about the, the growing of things. Isn't that amazing? This is all pertaining to our lives. And so we learn about the fruits of the Spirit. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? In Galatians 5, it says, 22 to 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, isn't that cute? <laughs> to me, this is like brilliant. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. So when you have the fruit of the Spirit, you don't need the law because you're following that which is right. You have the good soil. You, you have the right seeds. The law applies to the physical. Remember, without the Spirit, without the Spirit, the body is dead. And Elder has taught us this many times. And if you really look, if you really sit back and think about it, you will see it is so true. How many of you actually feel your surgeries, you know, when that happens? It's like, no, the spirit's gone. The spirit's gone. You're not feeling anything. So you don't need the law for your spirit. You follow the, the spirit. You follow the, the spirit of truth. And then your, your spirit, your soul will be fed. But the law is for the physical. It's to tame this physical because this is what gets corrupted first and foremost. So as we dedicate ourselves to sowing these seeds of virtue, we will witness the glorious harvest of our lives and our nation. So you, each person has to be responsible for gardening or for tilling their own soil, for cultivating their own gardens. And then we develop paradise. When you focus on your little piece and everybody focus on their little piece, you know, you can help somebody else, you can guide somebody else, but you've got to focus. You must focus on your piece. Then we can have our Eden back. Then we can be one and we can have our Eden back when we are all together with our lush gardens just like flourishing with the truth. So to cultivate a thriving spirit, spiritual garden, we must abide in the truth, which is even our Christ. And if we go to John 15, 5, we see that Christ declares, listen to this, I am the vine. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, so I've got to stop getting so excited. Sorry. <laughs> I am the vine, ye are the branches. Okay, look at it all coming together. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Look at that. For without me ye can do nothing. Did I not say without the Spirit you can do nothing? With, that, with the Spirit you can do everything. Without the Spirit you can do nothing. So think about that. So I want us to really think about the cultivating of our minds. Forget about somebody else's garden. Forget about what somebody else is doing. Yes, of course you can give advice. Of course you can help somebody if they're asking for help. But focus on your own garden. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1, is King Solomon says, to everything there is a season. I love it. What season are we in? Okay, all right, I've got to stop that. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. And as we, as Israelites, are in our new year, let us embrace the season of spiritual rejuvenation, inspired by the wisdom of our beloved Elder Shadrach. 
His message has shown us the importance of cultivating our spiritual garden and bearing fruit that glorifies our Heavenly Father. Isn't that awesome? Okay. Wow. May we carry the seed of wisdom that Elder Shadrach has planted in our hearts, nurturing them through prayer, right? Through prayer, through study, through obedience to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob's words. Let us follow in his footstep, becoming spiritual gardeners who sow love, joy, peace, and righteousness wherever we go. That's our job. And that's so easy if we just focus and stop putting our minds everywhere else. And as we conclude, may the almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob guide our steps, provide for our needs, grant us wisdom to cultivate a life rooted in his love and truth. And may the seeds Elder Shadrach has planted, because that is the word, the seed, may the seed that has been planted continue to grow, flourish, yielding a bountiful harvest for generations to come. So brethren, friends, guests, I pray that this year, this new year that has started, that we all focus, we all take time out and start to focus on our own minds, start to strengthen our own minds, start to cultivate our own gardens, try to start to select that right seed to put in the soil. Remember one thing, everything starts from the thought. And every thought, if we are not careful, can become words. And every word, if we are not careful of the kind of words, can become our actions. And every action, if we are not careful of our actions, can become a habit. Habits are good and bad. And if we are not careful, that becomes our character. It becomes our nature. You've got to watch that. And if we are not careful, it becomes our destiny. So let's take it back to the thoughts. Let's take it back to planting the right kind of thoughts. And on that note, I bid you a wonderful day. This is the eve of our Sabbath. Our Sabbath will begin this evening. And if you haven't already, please remember to share this message, to subscribe if you haven't subscribed, to put the bell notification on, because people always mention that, because apparently you will be notified when there is another message. And to make a comment, guys, talk about what kind of seeds are you going to be cultivating? What is it that you're going to be doing? Share that. Share that good seed. Share it. Comment in the, section, in the comment section. And on that note, I bid you peace. In the springtime Everything comes to life The birds and the bees The flower and the trees now The animals away From hibernation And this is all Our God's creation That's right.